Hello friends, before we start with the interview, I just want to shout out tonight's live stream where I'm going to be joined by David, who is Blind Coco, uh, for uh, a chapter of Gales of Naeli, which is what we're going to be talking about today in this interview. So if you want to ask the developer of Gales of Naeli any questions, come join us there. Or if you just want to see some live gameplay, that is the place to be. So again, look out for that stream tonight. And now on with the interview. Hello friends, Adam here with FED. Uh, today I'm joined by a, an incredibly special guest. I'm super excited to to have them here. Uh, this is uh, David. Tell yeah, us who, thanks for having me. Yeah, tell us who you are. Who the heck are you, David, and why do people care? <laughs> I'm the lead game designer for Girls of Nayeli. Uh, we just launched the Kickstarter today, so uh, that's the the start of it. Yes, that's so cool. Like, and you, and you hear like there's. I, how many of us grow up and say, "Oh, I want to, I want to like make video games," you know? But how many of us actually sit down and do it, right? Yeah, well, that's that's actually exactly my experience. I I studied in like web design and game design, so like my goal was always to end up into actually making video games. So being able to make that transition now is pretty uh, amazing. Yeah, that's really cool. Are, are you doing it full time? Is this like uh, your, yeah, this is your job recently. right now? Yeah, that's I so started cool. this year. Dude, that's like, sick. I, I started working on the project like last year, but this year I made the switch to really like put things into gear and get some progress going. That's so awesome, man. Um, when when did it? So I know you said it started off as a solo project. Um, mm -hmm. when, when at what point did you realize? Oh wait, I need some help. I can't do this by myself. Um, it was when I started to expand the scope because initially uh, there wasn't going to be like any custom map assets or battle animations. But when I realized that the gameplay was pretty fun and stood on its own two legs, like aside from the typical Fire Emblem comparison, uh, I tried to really push into like making the game its own thing. So bringing some other peoples to make uh, some assets and help with the story and stuff to make it more actually professional. The, that was the the real switch yeah uh it, and that's the thing so at this point full disclosure i have played two chapters uh or two maps of uh gales of naeli and, and it, it, he's right it, it does it, it's not just your generic srpg studio or generic you know fire emblem hack gameplay it's very unique um and it's, it's really interesting so far i'm excited to see what's next uh but speaking of fire emblem because that's what my channel's all about, Rand. Uh, what is your experience with Fire Emblem? And like, which one's your favorite? I started with FE7, so it always has like a special place in my heart as being like my gateway point. Um, but I, I think Fire Emblem 4 is my actual favorite, like as a very close contender to FE7. So did, did that, in, does FE4 have any influence on, uh, on Gales of Naoli? Uh, yeah, actually, I I really liked uh, what Kaga did with the uh, interactions between units, like when people get married and they have like some special conversations, and when they find some personal weapons or items that they 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 discover. I think he kind of maybe hit them a bit too much, <laughs> but oh, I yeah, like the idea sure. behind it, and that's why I wanted to push it in in my own game. So it's definitely a, a core influence for Gales of Naeli for sure. Yeah, FE4 is notoriously bad at allowing players to enjoy the game to its fullest, in my, in my opinion, right? On a, on a first playthrough, like, you're, not, you're never finding the Brave Axe, right? I, I do appreciate the fact that you don't necessarily find everything on a first playthrough. Like, it helps make repeat playthroughs more interesting. But the fact that you kind of need a guide to make use of most units, like Lex, who basically doesn't feel like Lex without the Brave Axe, which is hidden, yeah. kind of feels like a shame, but... Otherwise, I really like the the core concepts behind that. Yeah, I mean, I I do like I do like that. It, I, I'm okay missing stuff in the first playthrough. I don't need to find everything, right? But like, I don't know. Some of it's pretty obtuse. Like, why why would I ever send Arden to a random beach on a level to get the pursuit ring kind of thing? You know, just stuff like that. It's a little yeah, no, but it's hilarious. No hit. Oh, it's it's hilarious when it happens. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great. Okay, so uh, we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but I just want to—I want to give you the opportunity to to give me the sales pitch, you know, and, and the audience, of course. 
What is Gales of Naeli? Yeah, Gales of Naeli is basically what happens when uh, every unit in a Fire Emblem game gets their own personalized treatments. Uh, every unit has their own base class, their own skill sets, their own interactions with the rest of the cast. And that leads to some gameplay that isn't uh, so much class-based as Fire Emblem, but more uh, unit-based in your strategies. Like, for instance, uh, the difference between board and cord is pretty negligible. It's, it's like, yeah, it's a, it's a weapon rank. That's it, right? Yeah, it's a weapon rank and maybe like a little bit of speed. But otherwise, you're, you have a fighter on your team. They're going to do fighter things. They're going to use a hammer and then they're going to beat some armor knights. And that's pretty much what you can expect from a Well, yeah, a and, and, and beyond like gameplay, if I put a picture of both of them on screen... Yeah, especially FE1, but I'm saying like even if like FE, FE11, you know, Shadow Dragon, 90% of the audience here would not be able to tell me which one's which. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I would be hard-pressed to tell you which one's which, and I've played Shadow Dragon to death. So, so, so yeah, I, I really tried to push like the personalities of the characters in a way that influenced how they play, because it's always strange to me when characters don't behave within the gameplay the same way that they would behave if they were actually in control of their actions. Like, I know a while back I saw on Reddit a post where someone was playing, I think it was Path of Radiance, but they were trying to put the personalities of the characters into their actions and how they play. So like, Makalov would run away if his health was too low or something. So I kind of wanted to push that uh, idea where characters behave and the, the players like push to use them the way that they would actually behave in these scenarios yeah as i was playing the demo it actually made me think a lot of uh triangle strategy i don't know if you've played played through that i uh, haven't it's definitely on my list because it looks super interesting with the unique abilities as well yeah every like there's no there's no like classes that are shared between units or anything everyone's just a unique character with their own skill sets and weapon types and stuff like that and it's really uh it's really well done that way and your party composition becomes less about like building units and more about uh combining uh different kinds of units to make the play style you want right and mm -hmm. i i feel maybe not in like the same way but i feel like what you have going on here does a similar thing yeah, that's that sounds pretty similar in a in a way. Like, if you need some special tools, you're gonna bring the unit which has that specific tool, and not just like the units that you have trained. Yeah, I like and and, this, and the skills are really cool in this game, by the way, guys. Like, it's not like he, they're not just one for one. Like, oh, here is adept from uh, you know from Fire Emblem, or here is uh wrath from fire emblem like those those skills might make some sort of appearance in some way shape or form but there's a lot of unique stuff as well um i think my my favorite one that uh i came across was intimidate which is on like an armor knight kind of guy mm -hmm. um his name well, his name's sheriff right sheriff yes sheriff sheriff uh which like lowers enemy stats that are uh that start on, on player phase it lowers enemy stats if they're within like three tiles of him right so it's mm -hmm. like it reminded me of like Daunt from uh, from from Radiant Dawn, except actually good, um, <laughs> and like it's actually really cool. There's a lot of like uh, uh, stat manipulation stuff going on. So for for people who really like to min max their strategies and stuff, I think there's gonna be a lot for them there. Yeah, um, and it's a good thing that you pointed out, Charif, because uh, a real uh, a point that I tried to improve was the making Armor Knight viable without slowing down the gameplay too much to accommodate for them. So by giving them like interactive skills like this, I think it helps make them useful while still allowing units like Carrie, who's the early game thief, to run around, teleport using smoke bombs and clear side objectives. Oh yeah, yeah, smoke bombs. That's a really cool item, by the way. Really cool. Yeah, item. that's pretty cool. Like I, I, w I wasn't super clear on it. I didn't really try. Um, can anyone use smoke bombs? Uh, only thieves. Only thieves. Okay. So okay. anyone who has the lockpick ability will be labeled as a rogue class, and these rogue classes can use the smoke bombs as well as other rogue tools. Okay. Cool. 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 I, I wasn't sure about that because I didn't try, but I don't. I didn't. I didn't have any reason to try because I just had it on my thief people. 
Um, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, but yeah, it's a really cool item. So just for, for you, uh, the smoke bomb is a, an item that allows you just to teleport like through wall, like through walls, through any terrain, right? As mm-hmm. long as there is a traver- is there's like traversable terrain within like is it three spaces or two spaces? Yeah, it's three spaces, three and as spaces. long as you can walk on that specific tile, like with your movement type, you can teleport to it. Yeah, so it allows for some really interesting stuff, and like. Uh, in combination with the the avatar character, which we, I guess we should probably talk about that, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, the avatar character that uh, I don't know, there's 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 a certain kind. There's a there's a rogue that you can choose, and he has like uh, yeah, the avatar can be one of four classes. The adventurer, which uses sword, and is meant to be more like a frontliner. They have a similar situation to sheriffs intimidate, but they use their turn to debuff enemies, but it debuffs them like. I think it reduces their crit avoid by 25%. So it basically turns anyone attacking them into like killer weapon wielders, even without wielding killer weapons. That's cool. Uh, you have the mage who can focus uh, up to three times in a row. It takes their turn, but when they attack, they deal like way more damage. So it's all about like using your off turns to boost and then nuke like main targets and stuff. Uh, I think you used the rogue, right? Yeah, I did the rogue, which is why I think the smoke bombs are so cool, probably. Yeah, and the the rogue can act like twice per turn, but their second action reduces their movement. And the final is the archer, who uh, uh, deals a pretty significant chip damage and uh, can buff allies' uh, accuracy around him. So it allows you to use some more uh, riskier combat arts and units who typically struggle to deal like consistent damage but when they hit they hit hard so with the the archer uh avatar they can really shine yeah it's yeah really cool and like just hearing you talk about that kind of stuff like and there's a there's a lot going on here guys it's it's, it's a it's a fairly uh deep especially compared to fire emblem it feels fairly deep in terms of the strategies you can pull off um all right so I, I guess we'll, let's, we'll return to the questions that I have written here. Sorry, we've just been. I mean, you handled them well, just like random questions. Um, what 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 features present in Gales of Naali are you most excited for, or like most proud of that you've put in, or are going to put in the game? Yeah, uh, yeah, I kind of touched on it a bit earlier with the fact that every unit is like in their own class and stuff, and that also expands to the support system, which allows units to uh, not only talk four times and get married and whatever. Uh, but they actually like interact within the story and give each other's gifts or learn from each other's. I kind of wanted to expand what happened in Fates, where you could actually like take someone else's class by supporting them. But sometimes it kind of resulted into either using the DLCs to actually build the team that you want before you move forward, or you kind of ended up with like many units of the same class, unless you were actually like pre-planning your routes which with your reclass and stuff. So here I try to make it so the, the classes that unit learns from each other, they're more like a mixture of themselves and the unit they're supporting. Uh, like for instance, Carrie is the early game thief and Miles is the early game mage. And if they support each other, Miles gets a class that's basically a mage thief hybrid. So he can use smoke bombs, he can open, open chests, but he can also like sling spells and do some magic stuff with his uh, enchant abilities and light walls and stuff. So, oh, wait, so and, that, that's how, wait, sorry, I, I didn't even know this. So that's how supports are going to, your supports are going to affect like your class change a bit, like your class changing and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, exactly. Not that's every so cool. support will result into like a unique class, but every support will have at least like some held items, legendary weapons, or reclass options that unlock from them. So supports are worth doing, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Oh, uh, that's, that's <laughs> super, that's super cool, man. Yeah. Because everyone likes support conversations, right? Everyone, they're like, oh, I love learning more about the characters or whatever. Sorry, I, I say it sarcastically because it's something, I, I actually hate support conversations in Fire Emblem, generally. Um, but that's also why I wanted to add a, a gameplay reward for doing them. Because you can just plan supports and skip the conversations if you don't want them, but you can at least like customize your party into a way that you you actually want to use them. Yeah, I, I the 
that does sound like you took some uh, some FE4 uh, and threw and sprinkled it in there because you know like the early game of FE4 part one it kind of feels like a, a, a like a, a, a dating simulator almost you make characters get married so that you have the kind of units you want for the second generation right mm-hmm. and uh it sounds like you're kind of doing that except your characters kind of just mold and change over time that's that's a really cool uh direction to take that big fan of that thanks i'm glad you like it big fan of that idea for sure for sure uh okay permadeath i i I want to talk about this. I, I did let a character die uh, when I was trying it out, but they didn't die permanently. They came back to the next map, but they had like minus twenty avoid or something like that. And if they died again, they it was a game yeah, over. It was a game over. Yeah, so exactly. Like, so how does that all work? All right. So uh, for most maps, this is the system that we use for permadeath. If a unit gets wounded, they take a grievous wound which uh, they take more damage and they they get reduce avoid. And if they die again, uh, it's game over. It triggers like an actual game over and you reset. Uh, without this kind of penalty, it felt like people would just let people die and don't care. And while we want to encourage people to keep playing if units get wounded and stuff, it kind of felt like the risk reward ratio wasn't there. So we added the game over condition, but we also added a bandage consumable item that can remove the wound. So if someone gets wounded, it does affect your uh, their performance for a few chapters. But if you find a bandage or buy one, they can go back to normal, and it's as if they were never wounded. Okay, so uh, so so how long does that uh, that wounded status uh, last without any intervention from a bandage or something like that? Uh, it's permanent otherwise oh it's permanent oh fetch okay all right there's gonna be some events uh like some characters are like naturally healers and sometimes in some cutscenes or base conversations they could cleanse the wounds of someone but typically they're permanent otherwise uh if you don't use bandages okay how how common are these bandage items gonna be uh there's a few that are sprinkled in there as like uh actual rewards for villages and stuff but typically, they're not going to be rare uh, because they're going to be appear in shops. So, like, the penalty for buying a bandage is that you don't get to buy too many other cool weapons. Okay. But they're still, like, easy to find to actually, like, remove the, the wounds. See, I, I, I like this. I, I like that. Because, again, this, this is another fun, interesting take. Because other games that have come out recently, I guess I want... I don't know, I shouldn't name that. That'd be kind of... I'll, I'll name them. Dark Deity, right? um came out not too long ago i guess it's been has it been like two years now i don't know um and it had its whole thing with uh if a unit dies they like lose stats or whatever but it like felt neg- neg- negligible it's like oh no i lost four hp out of 85 you know whereas here i, I really like it because it really does make your unit kind of bad not in, like not super bad. I guess it depends on the unit, but at least the it one... affects only like the the bulk. So like I guess a backliner or an archer wouldn't get affected by reduced avoid or defenses, but a tank unit would probably get pretty much uh, nullified. Yeah. By that. yeah, in my in my uh, when I, when I did it, I had uh, my it was a sword, it was just like a a really lightweight sword fighter type guy. Mm-hmm. I can't remember his name. Um, I it was probably Flynn. Yeah, Flynn, Flynn, Flynn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he just like was basically useless. He would just, yeah, he's he just basically died. like a, <laughs> yeah, he's a mixture between like a myrmidon and a mercenary. So like getting twenty avoid penalty on him is pretty brutal. <laughs> yeah, so he went from being like having like <clears throat> like hit rates being like around forty to fifty on him from everything to being you know sixty seventy, and he was just getting destroyed. And like, there's nothing I could do for him. <laughs> Yeah, but even then, uh, he gets the Windblade combat art, which allows him to attack at range. So if you, if it wasn't like a two-chapter demo, you could probably keep going and use him as a Windblade bot until you found bandages and then bring him back to the front line. Well, yeah, and that's the thing. It didn't even make him, like, unusable or anything like that. Like, he has a, with his, with his personal sword weapon that I, that I, that I found, uh, he was still able to do, like, decent damage to some, like, monster dude. And like it was yeah. really cool, and like he's still usable. He still does damage. It's just like he's not going to be frontlining or taking uh, taking many hits successfully. So yeah, I, with I, I, the 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 
important point is to find the the balance between risk and reward and to make it so that people are encouraged to keep playing without making it insignificant to the penalty. Yeah, so uh, this is a good answer to permadeath, in, in my opinion. Good answer. It's cool. And speaking of which, there's actual permadeath in some specific maps on top of that. Oh. You're going to get a warning before the map starts, so you're not caught off guard. Oh, that's cool. But in situations where like retreat is not possible, these maps in particular will have permadeath toggled on. Oh, okay. This allows the story to actually account for character death in meaningful ways, in my opinion. That's really cool. All right. So permadeath is in the like, game, but only when the yeah. story like actually calls for it. Yeah, exactly. Because you're not just gonna get slain, like, you're not gonna get killed by some random brigand or something and like not run away. You're gonna yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. And like, you know, like in a, in Fire Emblem One, if Jigen dies to a random brigand at the start of the game, he just keeps talking to Mart between cutscenes and stuff because yeah, yeah. the game just won't allow him to die because he's too much too present within the story but if there was like a couple of maps in the game where he could die i think that the story would be allowed to actually have him die in these specific moments and adapt for it so that's what i'm going for for the the permadeath situation yeah all right that's really cool Really cool. All right. So, sorry, we've been talking for like 20 minutes already. I, I hate to take too much of your time, um, but I do want to get in and talk about your Kickstarter. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. So the Kickstarter for Gales of Nyeli, uh, find the link is in the description of the video. I'll put it in the comments as well. Um, it's just went up today or as of today, as of this recording, I'm going to try to have this video out today. Um, yeah, exactly. So tell us about it. What, what are your goals? What do you uh, expect? It, what can Kickstarters expect from, uh, from it? Uh, yeah, tell us about it. Yeah, sure. Our goal is 10,000 Canadian dollars. So probably around 8,000 US. Oh, uh, ca Canadian dollars? That's fake money. Yeah, it's uh, Monopoly money. It's Monopoly so. money. It smells like maple leaves or something. <laughs> I don't freaking know. <laughs> but yeah, um, our goal is that. Uh, we had some actual funds for the game at the start. The, the Kickstarter is mainly there to help with the assets, with the voice actors, with the animators and stuff. So anything that's given there will directly go towards making the game a more polished experience. Um, and yeah, I know you wanted to talk about the rewards and stuff. Yeah, but before that, so you mentioned voice acting. I think this is really oh, cool. Yeah. Um, I While I was playing it, the demo, not everyone's voiced yet because it's just, you know, haven't gotten there to it. Um, but the voices that did pop up, I thought were really well done. Um, are there are there any like big names or anything like that in your, your voice acting pool? Yeah, sure. You mentioned earlier that you got Flynn wounded. Well, I'm not sure Joe Zija would enjoy that um, because he's the one voicing him. Um, you, you telling me Claude's in this game? Yeah, I should probably flip his portrait upside down to make it more. Make it more obvious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that that's huge. Joe Ziha is a like in the Fire Emblem community is like the voice actor at this point, right? So that's so cool. Yeah, we're totally thrilled to have him on the board for the for Flynn. Um, and yeah, and all the other ones that I did here again, and not everyone's voiced yet, but everyone else that I did here did a great job. Oh uh, yeah, for sure. Um, everyone has been doing like a tremendous job, and. Uh, I'm looking forward to expanding the voice acting cast as well after the, the Kickstarter. Oh yeah. Super awesome. Super awesome. Sorry. I just want to talk about that. Cause that's like one of the cooler, I like cooler. It's like a really cool thing you have going for you. Um, yeah. So what can, uh, what can Kickstarters expect? What are some goals and, and extras and things you can get for being a Kickstarter? Uh, sure. Um, we're actually already planning to add a, a, a post game campaign, which is kind of similar to, I guess what FEA did with the monster. The monster campaign but we're trying to expand it a little bit more so one of our stretch goals is to have some maps that are procedurally generated so Ooh. like whenever you replay them it's not just the enemy loadouts that are different but the map layout as well so if we could reach that uh stretch goal that would be pretty pretty cool the fi fire fire emblem needs a rogue like compare like you know give it to us <laughs> i i honestly think that it could work i so... think it could work great yeah I, uh, I think that this like post game campaign, if we reach that stretch goal, could be a pretty solid proof of concept to show that it can actually work. Oh, for sure, that's cool, man. That's cool. Right, what what um, else? Yeah, um, in terms of uh, 
the another stretch goal that I'm gonna mention is the fact that um, we talked about having four possible classes for the avatar. Um, we are actually considering a fifth one, which is healer based, because from our playtest, some people have asked for it, but uh, it wasn't planned, so we kind of just put it as a stretch goal as being something cool. Since uh, healers in Gales of Naeli aren't just staff bots, they can all fight back in some way. Dude, there's one, some... one chick has a freaking gun. <laughs> yeah. Freaking I'm wild. Excited. Yeah, that's. We wanted to give them something unique because usually they just like. They heal for 10 to 15 levels and then they promote and then they're a worse version of whatever mage you were using beforehand. So by giving them some, some punch, they can actually like be meaningful units on their own yeah and they're pretty cool uh and, and they have some like useful skills too like the the, the, the fairy lady oh to, yeah uh, you know like minus, minus two damage to uh nearby allies and stuff that's really cool yeah and since she's a flying unit she can reposition after attacking so like you can position her in more interesting situations to benefit most of your team yeah. And I I don't know if this is how it's gonna are all heal staves uh, are they gonna or staves are they gonna be two range? Uh, most of them are. Yeah. Okay. So like of course there's a physic equivalent and stuff, but yeah. most healing staves are gonna be a one two range. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I, I keep I keep derailing the conversation because I I'm so fascinated by all these decisions that you've made because they feel so well thought out is the thing. Um, it's really cool stuff. So, oh, sorry. Keep going with the Kickstarter stuff. I'm well, so that's sorry. great to hear, actually. So, I'm so sorry. Since, <laughs> uh, I've been like building units, uh, skill set to mesh together in interesting situations. So, like, n no unit can like do 100% of the job required to be most maps. But the interactions between units is really what I'm trying to push. So, seeing that you like appreciate it and notice these relationships between units is really cool and gives me some pretty good hope for the the final product yeah there's a, there's a lot here a lot to unpack and it's going to be really interesting to see what people do with it mm -hmm, for sure um yeah you wanted to talk about the uh, actual kickstarter rewards yeah the, like some tier rewards yeah yeah oh uh, yeah uh the the more interesting ones in my opinions are the cursed relics and the legendary weapon tiers which allow uh, you to uh, give a, a name or a play style or something that you want to like encourage, like a, a tanky item or like a, a glass cannony approach. And the, the item will be tailor-made to that specific play style. It's still going to be balanced. And there, these items are going to be sprinkled kind of Kaga style within the world, which anyone can find, but only the backer itself is going to get the exact location of these items. Oh, that's cool. So, like, it it both gives something cool to the backer, since they're going to have, like, a, a, name, a named item after themselves, which is actually fun to use. But it also gives something to everything, everyone else who can actually go searching for these secrets all over the, the game. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds, re sounds really dope. So, guys, go, please... Go check out the Kickstarter. If what they have there looks interesting, which I think looks great, by the way. Uh, you chose some good screenshots and stuff, by the way, and that's just to show off. Um, support it if you can, or if you're or if you're interested. Uh, definitely worth uh, your time, in my opinion. Don't be scared away by the SRBG Studio uh, stuff because you know I I understand that can be kind of like a a turn off to some people but this shouldn't be it definitely pushes past that and does a great job of, of showing off what a good creative mind can do with the with the limited tools that srpg srpg studio gives you you know so do, uh, do you have any last words david uh anything else you'd like to say to the people um no everything i think has been said that's much appreciated thank you for the interview and for the shout out and for the kind words towards the project that's really uh I'm looking forward to the uh, the end of the Kickstarter so I can keep going on the project development. That's really nice. Oh yeah, for sure. I'm super excited to see what you uh, you do going forward, and I'm incredibly excited for the finished product. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming on. You're you're awesome. Uh, fun to talk to you. And thanks for watching, guys. Make sure to subscribe, like the video, and comment your thoughts. What do you think of what you've seen so far of Gales of Naeli? Uh, I'd be interested to hear what you think.